Inside of every computer is a web of components that work together quite miraculously to spit Counter-Strike out onto your monitor. Some of them help you multitask, while others do a bit of everything. That said, there is one key piece if you're trying to game. One golden component at the heart of every PC that prevents your games from, well, making you nauseous. In fact, this one thing can make or break an entire gaming rig. Your graphics card. They are the most sought after piece of hardware in the PC gaming world. And regardless of how clouted certain graphics cards may be, some people, myself included, don't even understand how they work. So today we're gonna break down what exactly a GPU does when you hop into a server, how it actually works, and what is perhaps the most ever burning question. Does having a good graphics card actually help you play better. For this week's episode, we've decided to team up with the crew over at AMD once again. But this time, we're gonna break down what exactly it is that a graphics card does. So what is a GPU? Well, first off, it's an acronym, which is about all I know about GPUs. GPU stands for Graphics Processing Unit. Scratch that, that's all I know about GPUs. In your PC, while your central processing unit, or CPU, is busy performing calculations for various programs, your GPU is working to render 3D images to your monitor. Now, both of them sit on the motherboard, but they're actually very different components. At its core, the simplest way to describe what a graphics card does for your computer is that it renders graphics and puts them on your monitor. I know. Thanks, Dimitri. Super helpful. But where did that all begin? Like, these things have been around for decades now, and let me tell you, that $4,000 card you're looking at on Amazon used to look a lot different. Well, to help answer this question, I brought in my boy Darren from AMD to help us out. Consumer graphics have been around since the mid-70s uh, in things like the first Atari console, which had dedicated graphics inside. But it was probably really in the early 80s, early to mid-80s, that the first commercial graphics cards were brought into the market. They were color graphics adapters, and their only job was really to emulate color in some of the early PC monitors at the time, more on the business side. But it wasn't until 1985 that operating systems like Windows became the norm and video cards started to be more accessible to the average consumer. In 1987, the IBM 8514 was released and basically became the single most popular graphics card on the market. But it wasn't exactly a graphics card like we know today. You see, the IBM 8514 was more of a display adapter that supported the 1024 by 768 resolution that many of those boomer CRT monitors had. And not long after, Canadian company ATI Technologies released their ATI Wonder Series cards, which allowed for dual monitor setups. Can you imagine these gangsters back in the late 80s running dual monitor setups and you're still not? This was a pretty big deal at the time. But in the early 1990s, application programming interfaces like OpenGL and Microsoft DirectX allowed developers to write code for nearly any type of graphics adapter. You see, in the 90s, graphics card production really hit the ground running. In the early 90s is when we saw the first graphics cards come into the market that were capable of 2D acceleration. Um, but then everything changed more in the mid 90s. In 1995, we saw the first graphics cards come into the market, which were capable of not only 2D acceleration, but also 3D and video acceleration. So on our side, the ATI Rage 3D was the first 3D uh, accelerated card that we produced. This was essentially the starting point for 3D support in graphics cards. GPUs like the S3 Verge and the 3D FX Voodoo dominated the market in the mid 90s. But when Nvidia released the GeForce 256 in 1999, that's when advances in GPU technology really stepped up. Over the next decade, NVIDIA and ATI were the two main competitors on the market, and in 2006, ATI was acquired by AMD. 
Since then, GeForce and Radeon cards that you probably recognize have been the best option available for gamers. Now, we've talked a lot about the history of GPUs, but CPU integrated graphics have come a long way, which has probably caused a lot of you to wonder, why is it that you can't just buy a really good CPU and have that do everything? And what it comes down to is the amount of cores. The average modern CPU has about eight cores, while GPUs have anywhere from 1,000 to 4,000. Now, this might sound like a lot, but each individual core on a CPU is much more powerful. This doesn't mean that the cores on a CPU are best used for processing graphics, however. At a very high level, CPUs are designed to be versatile, but ultimately they need to run through a series of tasks incredibly fast. The GPU's role is different. It's, it's really designed to break down really complex instructions into thousands or even millions of parallel tasks. So for example, in a game, you're rendering shapes, lighting, textures, all of this has to be done simultaneously. So it all has to be broken down and, and done in parallel. Um, in other words, the graphics processor has always been built around a more parallel processing approach. And as a result, it requires a much larger number of cores. So the CPU is basically the brain of your computer, sending instructions to all the rest of the components, while the GPU pumps images and graphics to your display. Graphics cards are pretty much a requirement for rendering 3D worlds in video games, especially in modern games where lighting and shadow effects have become much more realistic. But there is one key component to a graphics card that helps bolster its performance compared to rendering from a CPU, and that's VRAM. Now, you've likely heard of RAM before. It's the third or fourth best Daft Punk album. I'm kidding. It's memory stored directly on your computer's motherboard. Random access memory, also known as RAM, is very fast short-term memory which is used to store data that is regularly used by your computer. RAM helps with multitasking, so when you're opening your 10th Google Chrome tab, then it'll be there to help carry the load. Plenty of people commonly mistake their computer's memory for storage, but the latter is only reserved for hard drives and solid state drives which are used to store long-term memory. In this day and age, most computers have 8 to 16 gigabytes of RAM, depending on the user's needs. And when Colton is editing these heater videos, trust me, he needs RAM. So just like normal RAM, VRAM is used to store short-term memory. The thing is, it's much more accessible to your graphics card because it's built into the damn thing. So video RAM's dedicated graphics memory um, and it's allocated for the operations of your graphic card. It's very similar, almost identical to the way that your system memory works with your CPU. So video RAM is used to store and queue the data and assets that the GPU needs to process. All those visual assets get stored in the graphics memory before it gets rendered to your screen. Some information in certain games needs to be accessed regularly, so it's stored in your graphics card's VRAM and sent to the GPU. So when you load up Mirage for the f***ing millionth time, your computer loads the map's data into your GPU memory. So it already knows what to expect, because your graphics card already has bits and pieces of it stored in its VRAM. So in eSports, GPUs are pretty important. Plenty of titles like CSGO, Valorant, and even League of Legends are all heavily CPU bound, but they still need graphics cards to run well. Fundamentally, it's not different from playing any other game. It's really about rendering the game visuals. From an esports perspective specifically, the purpose of the GPU, I would say, is also to run your game as fast and smoothly as possible. You really want those fast frame rates. Sure, you can maybe squeeze out a couple of extra frames if you play with the absolute lowest possible settings using integrated graphics, but you don't wanna play a competitive shooter or MOBA if it looks like a slideshow. You know, typically we tend to see a lot of esports titles that throw a lot of calculations at the CPU where the graphics rendering isn't as taxing. Titles that are, are more uh, taxing on the GPU side, maybe a little bit more CPU centric, they're much more common in single player games like RPGs or real time strategy games. So where players are really cranking up their settings and resolution, where the game developers trying to create a really immersive experience. There's also some competitive titles though that 
you know, you can see some GPU bottlenecks on. They would be games like Rainbow Six Siege or PUBG as well, which are a little bit more taxing on the GPU side versus the, the CPU side. In a title like Rainbow Six Siege, there are actually certain settings you're gonna wanna keep on if you plan on competing at the highest level. Turning shadows or LOD down in Siege, for instance, will cause you to lose the shadows entirely and the hitboxes will start looking all square and pixelated. If you're playing a game at the highest level of competition, or plan to, then you want it to run smoothly. Most pro players run these games in excess of 200 frames per second to avoid any sort of screen tearing or input lag. That being said, integrated graphics have come a long way over the years and certain CPUs are now capable of running games like CSGO and Valorant at over 100 FPS in a 1080p resolution. Now, if you're a competitive player, you're gonna want a GPU. But if you're just starting out, like, what do you look for? Do you need to sell your kidney to secure a top of the line graphics card? Well, you don't wanna just stick a 3090 or 6900 XT in any old computer. If the rest of your components are too old or can't keep up with your GPU, then that's when you can start to experience something called bottlenecking. Or so I'm told. I don't know what bottlenecking. Can you just, Colton, can you just tell them what bottlenecking is? I don't know. And now, the guy who actually knows what he's talking about. Presented by AMD. Don't worry, Dimitri. I'll get to it. Just to drop some friendly advice off the top, if you're more into the competitive multiplayer experience, dreaming of going pro in Halo Infinite, then you don't really need a top of the line GPU. For esports titles, your main focus is smooth gameplay and low latency. But where that gets more complicated is if you also want to stream and create content. Software like OBS, vMix, VTube Studio, and the Adobe Suite can benefit greatly from expanded VRAM and higher core counts on both your CPU and GPU, especially if you're playing games at the same time. If you're just gonna rock a pre-built PC, you don't really have to worry about this. But if you're gonna take your games a little more seriously and maybe build your own rig or upgrade individual components, then creating a bottleneck is absolutely something you'll wanna be careful of. Obviously, a high-end GPU will help increase your FPS as well as the fidelity of the graphics your PC is able to pump out. But your GPU does all this working together with all the other parts in your PC. Dropping a top-of-the-line graphics card into your five-year-old gaming rig isn't going to make your graphics worse, but you will be leaving most of that card's performance, not to mention a lot of your hard-earned money, on the table, creating a bottleneck. And you don't even have to just take my word for it. So in terms of game performance, each is equally important. You always want to buy or build a system that pairs two that are roughly of equal capability. Otherwise, you're, you're going to create what we would call a performance bottleneck. Either your CPU is overpowered or your GPU is overpowered. They really need to be at an equal level in terms of performance and capability. Since your GPU still needs to get instructions from your CPU, access your RAM and other system memory, and all of that communication has to flow through your motherboard, it's far more important and cost-effective to get parts that are going to work well together and fall roughly within the same power level. Thankfully, we have the internet. If you're looking to beef up your PC gaming experience over the holidays or any other time of the year, then I recommend doing some research on not just a new GPU, but also all the other parts you want to put in your new rig, or the ones you already have to make sure you get the most out of your shiny new tech. Sites like PC Part Picker and the Linus Tech Tips forums can be an invaluable resource to those looking for more detailed PC building information. Do you need to know all of your PC components inside and out to become the next Valorant star? No, I can confirm it doesn't make you any better at games. It will, however, help you make better buying decisions when it comes to all of that fancy hardware that you're fragging out on. And that was the guy who actually knows what he's talking about presented by AMD. Now, there are some titles that are GPU bound, but thankfully, not in esports. The other thing as well for a lot of esports titles is they really want to have the widest player base they possibly can. So you'll see a lot of games really not try and push the envelopes on graphics because they want you to be able to play that on a mainstream graphics card, integrated graphics, pretty much anything. They, they want to attract as many players as possible. Modern games like GTA V, Cyberpunk, and New World need much more heavy lifting from your graphics card. In fact, having a powerful graphics card can massively improve performance when it comes to these titles. Now, unless you're an enthusiast-grade single-player gamer who genuinely cares about getting the best graphics, you don't really need to worry about getting one of these top-of-the-line GPUs. That said, you are going to need something to help out your CPU. GPUs have come a long way. 
They went from rendering basic 2D images to 3D masterpieces. The technology has steadily progressed over the past 30, almost 40 years. Nowadays, we can run our games and programs at insanely high frame rates at extremely high resolutions, and we can even do this across multiple displays. All of these are things that the gamers of old could only dream of. There's no doubt that all of these advancements in GPU technology have only helped us all enjoy the games that we love even more. Back in the late 80s, dude, these fuckers are running dual monitor setups. There's still fucking people. I still know people who don't have dual monitor setups. Absolute degenerate. Degenerates, Colton. Miles, that's it, Miles. Miles does not have a dual monitor setup. I was like, Miles. He used one, one in the office. Yeah, he doesn't have one at home. He's been working at home for a year and a half. That's what I'm saying, homie. Like, come on. There are Switch five monitors in front of me right now. There are five? That's five. Five. That's hype. I, well, I also have like three computers on my desk, so I mean, come on, Miles. Yeah, get your shit out. Get your head out of your ass. Get your head out of your ass. <laughs>